Hi everyone, welcome back to Useful Genetics. This is Lecture 1i, where we're going to talk about the fundamentals of what chromosomes are. We'll talk about both their physical structure and their informational content. We'll talk about the regulatory signals that a DNA molecule needs if it's to function as a chromosome. We'll talk about the different versions and the terminology that we use for these, and we'll talk about how we can represent chromosomes. Now, structurally, a chromosome is one very long molecule of DNA. Human chromosome X is 150 million base pairs long, very long. And the DNA isn't naked in the cell. The DNA is bound to and wrapped around proteins, as we described earlier. Informationally, a chromosome is one very long DNA sequence. And embedded in this sequence are sequences that specify genes and other functions, and they're embedded in a background of non-functional DNA sequences. The diagram on the right is various representations of aspects of the human X chromosome. We'll come back to representation later. Now, if a molecule of DNA is going to function as a chromosome, it has to have particular properties. It has to carry specific information. First, it have to, has to have signals that are represented by DNA replication proteins. These signals are called origins of DNA replication. And there's usually multiple origins of replication along the length of a chromosome. Chromosomes also need special sequences for where DNA replication ends. At the ends of the chromosomes, there are special sequences called telomeres. And these sequences exist because the ends of DNA molecules are harder to replicate than the internal parts of DNA molecules. Chromosomes also have to have special attachment point sequences called centromeres, one to each chromosome located at a particular place on the chromosome. And this is the place that fibers attach to when the cell is going to divide to pull the chromosomes apart. Finally, of course, chromosomes have to have genes. We'll talk about the genes on chromosomes in the next lecture. Now, human chromosomes, luckily, are fairly typical. We're fairly ordinary animals genetically. So we have, um, if you're female, you have 23 different chromosomes. If you're male, you actually have 24. Our chromosomes, that's different different chromosomes. You have two versions of each of these chromosomes, except for the X and Y chromosome if you're male. And we'll talk about this in module four, I think. Now, each chromosome, again, the X chromosome I described was typical. Each chromosome has got between 50 and 250 million base pairs of DNA. That's how long it is. And in that DNA sequence is the information for between about 400 to 4,000 genes, depending on the chromosome. The longer chromosomes have more genes on average. And as I said, each chromosome has different genes. Not just different versions, but completely different genes on each chromosome. Now, not all organisms have you know, modest numbers between, say, 5 and 50 or so chromosomes. There are some organisms that have all their genes spread over only a very few chromosomes. Some organisms will have their genes spread out over hundreds of tiny chromosomes. Now, these organisms generally have similar amounts of DNA to us. It's just that they've spread their DNA out in more pieces. Now, I have to introduce now some very important terminology that it will be critical that you be able to use clearly. And that is two alternative words that we, geneticists use instead of the word gene, which we've been using gene a lot, but actually it can be fairly ambiguous in important situations. And so geneticists have introduced two other terms, locus and allele. And we need these terms because chrome genes come in different versions. So allele refers to one of the versions of a gene. 
or a version of a DNA sequence, even if it's not a gene. Whereas locus refers to, it comes from the Greek or Latin meaning place, it refers to the location, the position where the gene occurs, the sequence that encodes the gene on a chromosome. And the term locus is used when you want to discuss the gene as a general thing and to include in your discussion all of the versions of the gene. This applies. So we can talk about the locus that codes for the ability to taste a particular chemical, for instance. And then we might say that this locus encodes a protein that comes in different versions. This locus has different alleles, different versions of the DNA sequence. So allele, where you would refer to version, and locus, where you're referring to the general gene in all its versions. Now, you've already seen several representations of chromosomes, and I haven't really explained them very much at all. So I'm going to talk quite a bit about that, this in the next couple of slides. So first, here's a representation showing what chromosomes actually look like under a microscope in a cell that was sort of frozen, stopped at, in the middle of cell division. Now, the chromosomes aren't neatly arranged like this and numbered in the cell. They're all spread out in a bit of a mess. And what the cytogeneticist who took this photograph has done is actually cut out the picture of each chromosome, cut out each chromosome from the picture, and then rearranged them on a piece of paper so that the two versions of chromosome 1 are together, the two versions of chromosome 2 are together, etc. This was the chromosomes of a male because they've got one version of the X and one version of the Y. Now, you notice that the chromosomes are actually, they're not very informative. They just look like little blobs. And sort of they're darker in some bits than others. These darker and lighter parts reflect different properties of binding to a dye that's used to color the chromosomes under the microscope. And the dark and light parts have become to be used as landmarks. So chromosomes are often represented by diagrams that show the dark and light bands as landmarks along the length of the DNA. Now, it's important to realize that the, these dark and light bands do not represent genes. There are many more genes than there are dark and light bands. They're just staining patterns that serve as landmarks. in the same way that the position of the centromere serves as a landmark. Now, teachers and students often represent chromosomes as sort of fat blobby X's or skinny butterflies, or they'll just draw a pair of lines like, you know, like that, like an X, and say, oh, there's a chromosome. That's not how chromosomes look, and it's best that you not represent them as that because it will actually create confusion in your mind. Now, how I'm going to represent chromosomes, quite a few different ways, but they're all going to be very simple. Um, I might show them as sort of rounded lines like this with constrictions showing the locations of the centromeres. Um, it's not that the length of the position of the centromeres is that important to what I'm talking about, but because it differs from chromosome to chromosome, they serve as ways to reinforce the point that these are different chromosomes with different genetic information. I've also drawn them different lengths to emphasize that point. More simply, I could draw chromosomes just as lines. This is especially likely if I'm just drawing them freehand. I might draw a line, and then I might draw a blob on it to indicate that this is the location of the centromere. I might sometimes just draw the lines without the centromeres. I may draw them as wiggly lines, especially if I want to emphasize that they're not neatly arranged in the cell, but they're actually sort of randomly located around the cell. Um, I may draw them, as I've done here, where I'm showing all of the chromosomes from a particular person in the same color. And of course, I haven't drawn all 23. I've only drawn a small number because that's all I need to make the point. And so I've drawn the chromosomes from one person in pink and the other person in blue. But you'll notice that the chromosomes are the same length in the two people. They just differ in their colors. I'm, in this case, I'm using color to indicate the source of the chromosomes, not the genetic information on the chromosomes. So these two chromosomes 
will have different versions of the same genes, different alleles of the same loci. These two chromosomes will have completely different genes. And again, here's another representation of chromosomes in a single person. Now I'm only drawing one chromosome using different colors again to indicate that this chromosome came from one person, his mom, this chromosome, this version came from another person. So what have we done? We've talked about the physical and informational content of chromosomes. We talked about the key regulatory signals that control how chromosomes function, that allow DNA to act as chromosomes. It has to have origins, telomeres, and centromeres. We've introduced other new terminology for dealing with the issues of having different versions of genes. And we've talked about how chromosomes can be represented. Coming up next, we're going to talk about the genes on the chromosomes. I hope to see you there.